Is it water with the sheep in the in the box? At this season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said one of the gentlemen, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the union workhouses? demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are, still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are still in full vigour then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I'm very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time, of all others, when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. That, as I'm sure you're aware, is the moment at which Ebenezer Scrooge, Dickens' most famous villain, dismisses charity workers collecting for the poor because, in his mind, the workhouses and treadmills, which were hellish places that basically forced the poor into indentured servitude in exchange for a place to sleep and a hot meal were more than sufficient because he deemed the poor to be undeserving of basic dignity or decent living conditions in his most famous novel, A Christmas Carol. This is the moment where we are shown the depths of Scrooge's callousness and disregard for the poor, dismissing them as idle, lazy, and that if they're not happy with the meagre concessions they've been given by Victorian society, then perhaps they should just fuck off and die already. Crucially, this is where we're shown that Scrooge, a caricature of of greed and callousness, and a cartoonishly evil man, is the villain of the piece, after mostly being told through the narration up to this point. Dickens wasn't known for his subtlety, and sometimes just having your villain say that he wants the poor to die is effective in getting the point across. Dickens, of course, wasn't to know this, but the character of Scrooge resonates throughout history, and even today, hundreds of years after the novel was first published, he remains relevant as liberals, sock dems, and conservatives alike scramble to belittle, infantilize, and dehumanize those on the lowest rung in society, and the hammer of discourse once again lands upon the nail of whether or not the poor deserve a hot meal every once in a while, and whether or not the welfare system is punitive enough to deter those disgusting poor from becoming lazy scroungers. As it turns out, there are people out there who read A Christmas Carol and determined that actually Scrooge was a misunderstood pragmatist who wanted the best for those in need, which he showed them by demonstrating tough love and encouraging them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps or something. For the modern iteration of this kind of person looked no further than Duma Media, formerly known as Duma Politics, who at time of writing has spent the past week or so arguing that people on food stamps are lazy and entitled layabouts, because if they made good decisions, they would already have pulled themselves out of poverty by their bootstraps. Again, literally indistinguishable from the caricature of a selfish, evil Victorian fictional villain. Here are just a couple of things he's said regarding poverty. Lefties are totally delusional about the reality of being poor in the US. You can be in favour of substantial welfare programs, as I am, without the delusional belief that poor people are all disabled with seven kids and four jobs in a food desert who can't possibly improve their life. Obviously, we should try and help poor people, but the same lefties decrying paternalism of the poor will look you dead in the face and tell you it's unreasonable to expect poor people to look up how to cook healthy food. The reality is that massive potential for social mobility exists, we already have huge social spending, and a homeless person in the US has more opportunities in life than a king would have 300 years ago. Treating people like they have no agency or potential for upward mobility as an excuse to exaggerate the ills of society is fucking disgusting, and you virtue signalling losers aren't helping anyone by acting like poor people are obviously stuck in their circumstances. Talking about poverty in the US as though people are trapped in it and can't possibly do anything to escape it or alter their circumstances is profoundly harmful. We can talk about ways to have better social programs without literally telling people they're permanently fucked. Almost every individual person is capable of pulling themselves out of poverty even if they have dire circumstances at one point. If you ever internalise the idea that things can't get better, that mindset locks you in, which is why I made the post. Poor people are stupid, make bad 
bad decisions and shouldn't be trusted. Snap restrictions are treating people like children, but they should be treated like children. If people were making good decisions, the US wouldn't have 50% of the population dying from obesity-related illness. See, we got one in the wild. You're a fucking moron. Do you think if a person is consistently making good decisions in the US for 10 years, they'll remain poor? This take also applies to people with disabilities unless they're unable to work entirely. And so on. He's been doing this constantly, both before and after he admitted to having significant familial wealth, and before and after he deleted all his tweets due to receiving pushback. This stuff was just what I found after about 10 minutes of scrolling his timeline. There's a lot more I didn't bother to screenshot. But obviously, this video isn't about one guy being a bit of a dickhead online and displaying his lack of empathy, feelings of superiority over others he deems beneath him, and extremely authoritarian leanings. I don't really know much about Duma Media outside of this and the fact that he made a semi-viral video about Vorsch, which is basically just what he'd expect at this point, a while back and frankly, outside of being frustrated that people like him are being taken in any way seriously in online lefty spaces, I don't really care about him. Or to put it another way, what I find more interesting and more important to discuss is what attitudes like this represent and just how popular they seem to be within mainstream western culture. Let's talk then about means testing the undeserving poor and whether or not unemployed people deserve Big Macs. Why don't you work like other men do? Now how can I work when there's no work to do? Why don't you save all the money you earn? If I didn't eat, I'd have money to burn. Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give us a handout to revive us again. Alright, so let's get this dumb debate out of the way first. Should we provide the unemployed or destitute with cash benefit or some kind of food vouchers? I've seen it argued a few times before that cash benefit would in some way impede the ability for people to campaign for universal healthcare and or that it's a contradiction or hypocrisy to do or something. And quite frankly, that's bullshit and we all know it. I, for example, am from a country that has both and whilst there are definite problems with each, mostly due to government corruption and corporate greed, they do mostly function and and literally no one here thinks to in any way regard them as conflicting or contradictory systems. There's a lot of history that comes along with it that doesn't exist in places like the States though of course since our welfare state began with the introduction of state funded healthcare and old age pensions at the same time so trying to separate them out isn't as easy as you might think. Regardless, that aside, in a vacuum, or somewhere like the US for example, where there's not the same history, should we provide cash benefit to the poor? It's my position that yes, we should, but I've seen a lot of arguments online about this recently, so to save time I'll go through what I believe are the most common opposing arguments and give my perspective on them here. Fuck the poor. Kids in this one I've seen a lot recently, and is, I believe, the origin of the weird you can't be pro cash benefit and also pro universal healthcare bullshit. The idea, I suppose, is that poor people will just buy KFC for every meal, smoke a pack of cigarettes every day, get fat and unhealthy, and then be a burden to the healthcare system or something, which is weirdly paternalistic, controlling, and infantilizing, not to mention kind of inconsistent, considering that not all people are unemployed and could just use their low wages, much of which may be taxpayer funded if said worker is employed either in the public sector or in one of the many corporations receiving tax subsidies to buy KFC or trade food stamps for cash on the black market and do the same. But it also assumes that poor people are so dumb that they would lie to get government assistance and then just blow all their cash on takeout and not feed their kids or themselves properly unless forced, which what the fuck. The fundamental question then is whether or not that's true. There are a lot of right wing and or liberal new news organisations, newspapers and political agitators who might try to claim that it is, both in the UK with the benefits cheats narrative, poverty porn bullshit I've talked about before, reaching the most ludicrous levels with Channel 4's dogs on the dole and salacious news articles about people who scam the system or something. Most of which is just pure bullshit incidentally, but even if it were 100% true, official statistics suggest that approximately just 1.4% of benefit claimants committed benefit fraud in 2020, 
so let's not pretend that this is a super common occurrence. And of course, the borderline racist concept of the welfare queen in the US. So a lot of people believe in this idea that some people cheat the system and or waste their benefit money on frivolous bullshit, drugs and so on, on a wide enough scale to be cause for concern. Well, unlike people on Twitter who just don't like poor people and want an excuse to call them all fat lazy scum, I actually looked into this and did some proper research and as it turns out, there have been quite a few studies into this particular topic, including one from the TUC, which I recommend reading and which I'll link below. The vast majority of which point to the predictable conclusion that almost all people on benefits are legitimately on them, just barely scrape by on what they're given, are actively looking for work and spend their benefit payments on basic necessities like food, rent and household bills. In fact, most papers I read on the subject argued that benefit payments were too low and don't provide people with a decent enough standard of living, recommending increases. Regardless, returning to the point here, the idea that you can force someone to be healthy based entirely upon what kind of food they're allowed to buy is absurd. For a start, depending on how it's cooked, a lot of healthy foods can be made extremely unhealthy. Take the humble potato as an example. Boiled and unseasoned, it can be considered healthy in some cases, but baked and served with salt, cheese and butter, suddenly it becomes rather less so. Even a pack of frozen veg can be deep fried, battered and made unhealthy, but tasty given the right circumstances. A fish on its own is quite healthy, but a battered fish is not, and likewise, what's to stop someone making chips out of potatoes that they've legitimately bought with their food vouchers or whatever? They're not allowed chips from McDonald's, but they can make their own equally unhealthy version at home. These food stamp rules are usually just fucking absurd and contradictory anyway. You can buy frozen oven chips, pizzas, snacks, and sugary drinks with food stamps, but not a cooked rotisserie chicken because we need to preserve your health or something. Honestly, if you can buy an uncooked chicken, why can't you buy a cooked one? It's just arbitrarily being a dick at this point. Not to mention how much more difficult this all gets once you factor in things like disability and or dietary requirements, but more on that in a moment. Let's go through a couple of examples on this arbitrariness, shall we? Taken from James Medlock, talking about California's WIC program. WIC is one of our most paternalistic programs and we could gain so much by just giving eligible recipients cash instead. You can buy cereal with it, but it must contain no more than 21.1 grams of sucrose and other sugars per 100 grams of dry cereal. You can buy juice, but it must contain 72 milligrams of vitamin C per 8 fluid ounce. It's up to the states to decide whether or not you're allowed to buy goat's milk as a substitute for cow's milk. Gotta love federalism. If you buy cheese, there is a requirement that it's domestic cheese. You can buy yogurt, but it cannot be drinkable or contain nuts. Tofu is fine as long as there's no added sodium. You can get any type of egg except hard-boiled egg unless you're homeless, in which case it's up to the state discretion. You can buy canned beans but not canned immature legumes like green beans. Ah yes, who doesn't love the classic WIC policy memorandum 2015-3 eligibility of white potatoes for purchase with the cash value vouchers. We should just make it universal and cash based instead. And all this just kind of skirts around the fact that due to their poverty and dodgy landlords being dodgy, a lot of people on food stamps might not have access to the kind of equipment one might expect or require them to have for any of this to work. What if they're fridge breaks. They can't afford a new one or to get a cheap secondhand one, and they can't even use some of their food money to get it fixed because they have no food money. It's all in stamps and vouchers. Or what happens if their oven or hob breaks? I was recently in that position, actually. My old house had really dodgy electrics and the oven broke, and it took the landlord over a month to fix it, meaning that me and my housemates had to live off takeaway or microwavable foods. And remember that assuming that someone has a microwave may not be entirely accurate either, which we were able to do because we were all working but even then, on our incomes, it became a bit of a struggle by the end of the month. I can't imagine how difficult it would have been if we were given significantly less money and told to live on an arbitrarily restricted list of food items based ostensibly, though not really in practice, on forcing us to eat healthy. Which leads us neatly on to... Fuck the poor. This is a patronising one, and I'm not a fan of anyone who uses it, to be honest. The idea is that the poor are just lazy because rather than buying ingredients and cooking everything from scratch, they just sit around and eat cheap, easy meals. This is quite brief to break down, but there's a few things to bring up. First, and most importantly, time. The perception is that people on unemployment are just sitting around all day, not doing anything. Watching Jeremy Kyle was the stereotype of my youth, but obviously that's no longer relevant. So they have all the time in the world to cook. The 
problem with that is that it's simply not true in all cases. In the UK, the expectation is that you spend several hours a day actively looking for work and must be able to prove that you've done so. And even ignoring that, people don't really take into consideration that maybe someone who has small children or is a full-time carer for a loved one may not have all that much time to cook, but may still be on these food stamps and or universal credit, and spending five hours to make every meal from scratch in order to save a few bucks probably isn't worth it for most people. Also, of course, it once again ignores the existence of disabled people. What if you can't spend hours cooking? What if you have mobility, chronic pain or fatigue issues? What if you're struggling with severe mental health problems? It's easy to say, well, just cook everything from scratch, but for a lot of people, this ignores the realities of their lives, experiences, and responsibilities. It's an option for some, but not all people in this situation, and if it's not applicable to everyone in the group being advised, then it's just bad advice, isn't it? Fuck the poor. In when it comes to benefits, welfare, and just being decent to those on the lowest rung in society, of course we must acknowledge the fact that much of this debate is ideological. It presupposes that long-term physical health should take precedence over freedom of choice, autonomy, or simply the ability to give oneself a treat every once in a while. It's very depressing in that way, I guess, and doesn't seem to really take mental health into consideration. It's keeping the poor in a cage and force-feeding them vegetables until they get thin, which sure might work if your goal is to get them to be thinner, but also that kind of restriction of freedom and autonomy can have severe effects on the psychological well-being of the unemployed person and may actually impede their ability to look for and find work, which is of course rather counterproductive. This also covers the oft-brought-up comments about incentivizing people to work, beloved by Tories, with the idea being that if you make life as miserable as fucking possible for the unemployed, they'll have no choice but to find work. Well, as we just established, most unemployed people are looking for work, but the fact is that right now there are more unemployed people than there are jobs, and this trend is only going to continue the more and more jobs are taken over by automation. The amount of obsolete jobs and the amount of people out of work is only going to rise exponentially in the coming years, and making life more and more miserable for those unable to find work is not going to change that very simple fact. Additionally, let's not forget that due in part to the rise of zero-hour contracts, poor working conditions, and the gig economy, a lot of people receiving government assistance are working, and likewise, a lot are simply unable to work due to disability or illness, but this kind of attitude is what leads people like this being declared fit for work, because if we let anyone who has a disability claim welfare, people will just pretend to be disabled. So let's just make it impossible to count as properly disabled, force wheelchair users to crawl upstairs and humiliate them over and over again and push them into a job they cannot do, which will exacerbate their pre-existing health issues. I'm sure this will end well for everyone involved. Rather than the stick, which doesn't seem to be very effective, perhaps it's time to use the carrot approach. Maybe if we gave unemployed people the help they need, they'd be in a better position to be able to look for and get work, and maybe if we get rid of zero-hour contracts and gig work and raise wages, guaranteeing a decent standard of living for every working person with a robust safety net for those who find themselves out of work, more people might be incentivized to find work. Not because the alternative is literal torture at the hands of the state, but because they want to, because working is actually something worth doing. Maybe if we treat people with basic decency and respect and work together with with them to find a solution to their problems, we could make the world a better place and not have to violently repress the disabled at all. Oh wait, no, that's evil utopian socialism. Sorry, I forgot. Fuck the poor. I'm not pretending anymore that I really give two shits about some kids in Bangalore. This is a really weird one, but let's briefly go over it. As we just established, most people on benefits are actually buying necessities, not drugs, but this is similar to the weird ideas about the homeless that people seem to like to cling on to, that you've almost certainly heard before. Don't give them money, they'll just buy heroin with it. The simple fact of the matter here is that rather than being unemployed because they want to do drugs, most addicts are unemployed because they suffer from addiction, and as a result are unable to find new work. It may seem 
seem like a distinction without a difference, but the difference is the framing and the reality. It's not a choice. For this extreme minority of addicts, the answer is not preventing them from accessing cash, but providing assistance. There should be free addiction support and or therapy to help those suffering from addiction issues to enable them to get over or manage their addiction, enabling them to re-enter the workforce without having to hide or deal with withdrawals or indulging their addictions at work, leading to getting fired. Our current system clearly isn't working and just telling people to stop doing drugs has so far not yielded particularly encouraging results, so let's give something else a try, eh? After all, the optimal outcome here is getting people back into work and in a position where they're able to hold down a job long term, right? Well, as it turns out, the best way to do that is by helping people who are struggling, putting more funding, not less, into addiction and unemployment services and having empathy and understanding for those who find themselves in unfortunate situations, not treating them like shit until they somehow magically get better on their own or something. Sorry, I know it's less viscerally satisfying to help people rather than punishing them, but it works. Why the rich and mighty capitalist goes dressed in jewels and silk. My darling blue-eyed baby has died for the want of milk. I suggest you come to the Norfolk Suffolk border areas of East Anglia. Landowners who wish to control ragwort face an impossible task when roadside verges are dominated by it to an extent I cannot remember in the past. There would be little cost to bring that under control if the unemployed and low-level criminals were required as part of their contribution to the society which finances them, or which they have abused, to uproot this weed. Given a bit of organisation, unemployed young people would be happy doing something constructive. That's something constructive for them. It's appealing, it gets rid of a weed which is a danger to some animals and helps landowners in the cultivation of their land. That was my thought that caused me to suggest the idea. In a way it's a form of national service, of doing something for society, in a way in which anyone unless they are physically disabled can participate. It's workfare, but I think there are some powerful arguments for workfare. It's impossible to talk about welfare and benefits without talking about the Poor Law Amendment Act, which essentially existed to victimise and punish so-called undeserving poor people, who are deemed able to work but not currently in work from accessing programmes that existed to help those in need and codify in law, a concept that had existed for a long time beforehand, but until then was never officially recognised, that some, perhaps even most, of the poor were simply lazy, indolent, or, well, undeserving of any assistance, whereas others, the elderly, so-called genuinely disabled and so on, were unable to work and therefore counted as deserving of basic assistance. This is the origin of the workhouse, of course. The purpose was to make them as brutal and horrific as possible in order to deter people from using them unless in extreme dire straits. Rates. In my opinion, our modern welfare system exists to do very much the same. Sure, there are no workhouses anymore, but often the unemployed are forced to do unpaid labour to earn their welfare, are demonised as welfare cheats, dishonest liars and thieves stealing from the taxpayer, and every possible humiliation that can be forced upon them is very much piled on. They are unable to find a place to rent most of the time under a system of food stamps, they are controlled and restricted in what food they can and can't eat, they are forced to enjoy the embarrassment of presenting their food stamps to the cashier, outing themselves as poor in front of the entire queue of shoppers and staff, and so on. A thousand humiliations and active levels of demonisation. Overall, they are deemed lazy, entitled, and a drain on society and taxpayers' money. Let's explore this unfortunately enduring idea then, shall we? This is the central question, right? What's more important to you? Personal autonomy, dignity and freedom, or punishing those you believe are undeserving, making sure they don't get one second of enjoyment or respite under the guise of making sure they remain healthy? Look, sorry, but my view on unemployed people is the same as my view on prisoners and other such people on the lowest rung of society. Give people empathy, provide whatever help they require, and enable them to re-enter society on their own terms, working together to enable them to become a valued member of society rather than punishing them for their unfortunate situation. Should people on unemployment benefit be allowed to buy fast food? I mean, 
Yeah, sure, maybe not for every meal, but I wouldn't recommend that anyone does that. For me, this is a non-issue. I legitimately do not understand why anyone would think that a poor person being able to have a takeaway or some kind of fast food every so often as a small treat or comfort meal is a bad thing or in any way objectionable. Sometimes people will go off on one about taxpayers' money buying Big Macs, but let's be honest here, that's already happened. Famously in the US under Trump and not long ago in the UK, MPs were using taxpayer-funded expenses to buy a car for their ducks, and frankly, I'd rather some out-of-work single mother bought her kids a Happy Meal with my tax dollars than whatever the fuck this shit is supposed to be. If your main concern is taxpayers' money, then maybe start with that, and after that there's a lot of other areas where your tax dollars shouldn't be going, like for example corporate subsidies, the military-industrial complex, the billions that the UK government literally just lost and frittered away during the Covid crisis, and so on. I think we as a society often forget or overlook the fact that unemployed people and people in the greatest need are still people and as such deserve at least a little dignity and respect. Being in that much poverty is already miserable enough without some entitled LARPer with extensive family wealth telling you that actually you don't deserve a hot meal every once in a while. Get back to work, peasant. <laughs> Means testing is, in the briefest possible terms, a method through which potential recipients of social welfare programs must be forced to prove that they need them. In theory, this is to stop benefit cheats, but in practice, it just renders the social program less effective, more expensive, and puts prohibitively complex and intimidating bureaucratic requirements on the people in the greatest need before providing any assistance. Additionally, it creates further problems, like the stigma of potentially being a liar or a cheat because the onus is on the recipient to prove that they are truly in need, and the base assumption is that they are a liar until proven otherwise. Likewise, means tests that used asset-based limits, such as requiring one to have little or no savings, or placing restrictions on assets to qualify, not only discourage saving because of the cost of being disqualified from such savings, but also require people to become completely destitute to qualify and prevent them from having any much-need savings when attempting to escape poverty. In fact, personal anecdote, I used to work with a guy who previously to getting the job where I met him, told me that he tried to claim benefits but his work coach told him that in order to qualify he would need to sell his house. And of course, means tests increase administrative costs, which comes out of taxpayers' pockets, due to the work of verifying that the tests are satisfied and, to use a phrase beloved of the right-wing media in the UK, rooting out the benefit cheats. The UK has done this multiple times, claiming to be cracking down on the scroungers, and every single time has spent significantly more money on trying, and often failing, to find these benefit cheats than they saved by stopping them claiming benefits fraudulently. But it's not ever about taxpayer money, not really. If it was, the government would be going after billionaire tax dodgers, the super rich, and looking to cut corporate subsidies, but as things stand, astronomically more taxpayers' money is lost through tax avoidance from the rich than benefit cheating from the poor. After all, according to the government's own data, benefit fraud represents 2% of the total annual fraud in the UK, as opposed to tax fraud which makes up approximately 70%. Honestly though, I doubt that anyone in Parliament really gives a shit about someone claiming an extra couple of hundred quid a month in universal credit. That sort of thing is a drop in the bucket in the grand scheme of things. No, what this is, is an ideological crusade and a political stunt. For a perfect illustration of this, look no further than the recent report showing that the UK government pursued benefit fraud 23 times more than tax fraud over the past decade, ultimately costing the taxpayer significantly more than was recuperated by stopping the fraudsters. Every so often the government will crack down on those on the lowest rung of society searching for a boogeyman because it gets votes, it makes them look tough, it makes them look like they're actually doing something and gets people on their side. After all, nobody likes a scrounger, right? Sadly, the effect of these crackdowns, whilst they may catch a couple of people being dodgy and scamming the government of 200 quid a month or something, is more often simply pushing more and more people into abject poverty and destitution. A prime example example of this is the crackdown on disability claimants, starting a few years back. The media and the government was awash with claims of people fraudulently claiming disability benefit, pretending to be disabled in order to steal money from the hardworking taxpayer or some shit, and this rhetoric whipped public up into such an outraged frenzy that the government could justify 
passing legislation that required vigorous means testing for anyone to qualify for disability benefit going forward. The result of this is the current status quo for disabled people in the UK right now. An unqualified disability assessor gets to decide if you're really disabled or just faking it, and does everything they possibly can to prove that you're a liar. They have a quota of how many people they're allowed to designate as legitimately disabled, get in trouble with their boss if they go over that quota, and a lot of the time they get it totally wrong. Guilty of benefit fraud until proven innocent basically. And this is how you end up with stories about wheelchair users being forced to drag themselves up flights of stairs, people with no arms or legs being declared fit for work and so on. People are forced to prove that they're disabled enough to deserve government assistance and if the DWP doesn't believe you, even if you're obviously too disabled to work, your benefits get cut and you'll be forced into work you physically cannot do or left out in the cold, which in this case means the avoidable deaths of thousands of disabled vulnerable people. In what could argue be described as a genocide by indifference. My favourite example of this is the classic tactic of declaring someone not disabled because they forced themselves to attend a meeting with an assessor because it's a lose-lose and somehow totally legal. The assessor rents out a room at the top floor of a building and is able to assert that if the claimant were really disabled they wouldn't have been able to get up all those stairs, but also if they didn't attend the meeting they obviously aren't taking this seriously and shouldn't receive their benefits. You have to attend DWP meetings, it's essential to prove that you're not lying about being disabled. I've known people with severe physical disabilities get rejected for government assistance. People who walk with a stick and sometimes can barely move on a bad day and they don't count as being really disabled. I know of other people who have felt it necessary to deliberately induce a bad day, causing themselves severe pain and physical difficulty so that they meet the requirements for deserving disability benefits because the assessors are either unable or unwilling to accept that disabled people can be almost unable to move some days and be significantly more mobile on others, and if you see them on a good day, they may not seem as disabled as they are. That's what means testing is. It's putting barriers in place to prevent people from accessing the services and programs they need to survive, and once again reinforces not only the idea of deserving and undeserving poor, but also harms the most vulnerable in society, pitting the poor against one another in order to score political points and looking tough on scroungers whilst ignoring the incalculable sums lost through billions air tax avoidance. Nobody who makes these kinds of arguments really gives a shit about the well-being of those in need. They blame the poor for their own misfortune and claim to be paternalistically looking after them with their best interests at heart by controlling and restricting their every movement and punishing them whilst claiming it's for their own good or something. The problem is not something that can be resolved on an individual level, and that's kind of the point, because in the mind of your average conservative and liberal if pushed, it's the fault of the poor when they find themselves in unfortunate situations and they have to pull themselves up by their bootstraps if they really want to get out of poverty. You really think someone making good decisions would remain poor in America? The idea is that by controlling and restricting someone to only the most healthy options, you're somehow improving their life and giving them the opportunity to make more informed and responsible decisions, but this of course ignores the fact that in doing so you're necessarily removing their freedom and choices, which I thought was the opposite of the point of conservatism, but I suppose not. Regardless, this individualising of the problem, claiming that it's just poor poor people's fault and or poor choices that got them into their predicaments is inaccurate and does not help in any way. The problem is systemic. The system is fucked and individual solutions do not help to fix a broken system. It's all well and good to say poor people should learn to cook, but that's not really something that can or will bring about widespread systemic change. Should we teach them to cook? I feel like free cookery classes for the unemployed would be rather expensive and we're supposed to be up in arms about public spending on welfare, whereas the solution requires more. You're concerned about obesity? Okay, subsidise healthy foods, stop putting fucking corn syrup and everything, and provide everyone with a decent standard of living through assistance and downtime to cook healthy food, I guess, but isn't it a person's god-given right to eat whatever the fuck they want? Isn't that the American dream? Oh, you just don't like fast food giants like McDonald's? Sure, I guess I agree with you there, but how is that any different to a food stamp recipient getting food from Walmart? Why are you so anti-business all of a sudden? Why are fast food chains evil, but grocery chains are fine? Long-haired preachers come out every night Try to tell you what's wrong and what's right But when asked how about something to eat 
they will answer with voices so sweet. You will eat by and by in that glorious land above the sky, way up high, work and pray, live on hay. You'll get pie in the sky when you die. Recently, at a meeting of the UN, almost all nations voted to declare food a basic human right, other than the US, which voted no, and a number of absentee voters. We require food to survive, and often abject poverty is defined by the amount of calories one is able to consume on average. Water, similarly, is generally considered something necessary to support human life and society. So why aren't these things provided to us free of charge? It seems very odd that something so vital to our survival is paywalled when you think about it that way. But I suppose one can make the same or at least similar argument for a lot of things, and in fact I have in the past. I think it's important to acknowledge that this whole point is pretty much moot anyway because reasonable people would definitely consider food a human right, but for some reason don't want to take the next step and declare that food should be free. We'll happily accept that stuff like education and healthcare should be free, and even railways in some places, but not food? Seems kind of weird, and perhaps we should consider that rather than fighting over who gets to eat a Big Mac and whether or not it's okay to buy a whopper with taxpayer funding, instead we should be thinking about abolishing the idea of paying for food in general. Maybe that's just wishful thinking though. If we can't even renationalize the railways and the Americans can't provide clean drinking water to their citizens as is, maybe a lot more work needs to be done before we're quite ready for these radical ideas. It is my belief, and in my opinion this should be a more widely held value throughout society because it just makes sense to me, that everything that can kill by its absence, for example food, water, shelter, healthcare and so on, should be free at the point of access without restrictions or caveat. Of course, I also believe that more than just that should be free at the point of access, but in my opinion, that's the baseline, and time after time, it's been demonstrated that people who have their most basic needs met are happier, more productive, and contribute significantly more to society and their community. So maybe we just need to shift our perspectives a little bit. On a fundamental level, which is worse? The fact that poor people might buy KFC with welfare payments, or the fact that something is fundamental to our existence as food costs money in the first place. Some food for thought there. Working men of all countries unite. Side by side we for freedom will fight. When this world and its wealth we have gained. To the grafters we'll sing this refrain. You will eat by and by. When you've learned how to cook and a fry and bake a pie chop some wood it'll do you good <coughs> and you'll eat in the sweet by and by you wise guy those are my thoughts on this whole discourse. At time of writing, the main discussion surrounding this has mostly died down because I work full time and I have a social life, so I'm not able to pump these videos out as and when the discourse is fresh, but I think it's still important to discuss this stuff, and let's be honest here, this is not exactly a niche or irrelevant discussion we're having here. I can't really speak for other places, but here in the UK, the characterization of the poor, and especially the unemployed, as work-shy scroungers, drains on society and taxpayers' money, and ultimately stupid, ignorant, and unable to to take responsibility for themselves or their children is not exactly uncommon. So should we give people cash benefit? Honestly, going by all the studies I've read, it seems to be the most effective, humane and pragmatic solution, both for ensuring long-term health and enabling people using it to more comfortably care for their children and also find their way back into work. I think the most important takeaway from this whole discussion is that we need to fundamentally shift our perception and the way we view and think about certain kinds of people. We need to embrace those on the bottom rung of society with significantly more empathy than we currently do. Additionally, we need to take a look at the information available and decide what really works, because it seems that rather than punitive and authoritarian methods, what actually reduces the amount of unemployed people is a more empathetic society that works with the most vulnerable in order to meet their needs and work together to enable and incentivize them to work. Carrot rather than stick. You can blame the poor, you can claim that the unemployed are just lazy, you can say that if they're not happy with the workhouses, they can just die and decrease the surplus population all you like, but at the end of the day, all that is is neoliberal virtue signalling without putting forward any actually good ideas or suggestions. Austerity and means testing do nothing but harm the vulnerable, and if you're going to support austerity policies, at least admit that that's what you're choosing to do, and don't pretend to give a shit about poor people being too fat or some bullshit.
it. I don't like work, and work don't like me, and that is the reason I am so hungry. Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give us a hand out to revive us again. Hello everyone, thanks so much for watching this video. Uh, it's a return to form, I guess, since the last few videos have been more kind of, well I guess more sort of documentary-esque. I don't really know how I feel about describing my videos as being documentaries, but I guess it could definitely be said that, that some of them are, are documentary-like. Uh, yeah, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, it's uh, one that's quite close to uh, one of my first ever videos actually, the one I did about, about homeless. Um, I think it's really important to discuss this kind of stuff really, and push back again these widely held but absolutely unhinged beliefs, especially when they appear in ostensibly lefty spaces, although I don't think that that Duma Media guy is in any way left wing. Thanks so much for watching any anyway everyone. Um, as always, the links to all of my various social medias, including my Patreon, is in the description, and if you'd like to follow those, please feel free to do so. Uh, if you donate more than one dollar to me on Patreon, uh, you'll actually get your name appearing on screen like this, and if you donate more than two dollars i'll read out your name at the end of the credit you also get behind the scenes uh kind of stuff like uh get videos when they're done uh, a couple of days before they they go on youtube as well as uh, video scripts and things like that um I'm, i am going to be making some patreon exclusive content so look out for that i'm thinking i might do like a couple of reaction things or or maybe like a commentary on some of my earliest videos so uh that'll be fun uh i'll look into getting around to do that at some point this week so feel free to describe so subscribe at five dollars or more if you want to see that exclusive content as i said if you get if you donate two dollars or more i'll actually read your name out at the end of the credits so today i'd especially like to thank elise the mighty she beast aride chris ragnacci generally queer next we have ryan uh brian it's brian the bulk tom newport caleb shipley felix sanguis classtrup nanza kambe oft wears hats Susie m and bob as well as les the mystical dinosaur thanks so much for watching everyone and i hope you have a good one Bye.